Hi, welcome to Chemistry 1001. We're talking about states of matter. Let's talk briefly about solids, their properties and phase changes. Well, solids come in many different types. Um, here's a picture indicating the different types that we can have. Um, this is a cylinder of purified silicon. Uh, silicon has a structure very much like carbon. It's a tetrahedral network solid, uh, which is shown over here. And it forms a crystal. Uh, crystals are regular arrangements of atoms in space, and they have particular properties. If you smash a crystalline material, it will tend to fracture around particular directions, such as in this NaCl crystal, which is a cubical array of sodium and chlorine ions. If we smash this crystal, it will break into little cubes, and that reflects the cubical arrangement of the atoms in the crystal. Silicon will not break into little cubes because it's a network solid, but it will have preferential planes of breakage, nevertheless. So those are crystalline solids, but not all crystalline solids are brittle, like these non-metallic substances. We have metallic substances, which are, as you know, quite soft. They conduct electricity and heat very well, um, mainly because uh, heat uh, is the vibration of the atoms in the solid, and those atoms are relatively loosely held. It depends on the metal, relatively loosely held because the positively charged nuclei are swimming in a sea of electrons. So the nuclei can vibrate relatively easily and they can transmit heat quite well. Uh, and that also means that metals tend to be a little bit more ductile. You can squash them because the uh, nuclei can slide over one another uh, in a much more easy way than they can in silicon. So these are ordered materials. That's one class of uh, materials and we call those crystalline materials. Yes, we can have crystals of metal and this is a particular nanocrystal of the metal. Uh, you have to grow crystals of metal from molten, molten metal uh, and you have to cool down the metal slowly and then you will see the crystals of metal forming. This material here is plastic. Um, it's an amorphous solid. Uh, an amorphous solid is a disordered arrangement of the atoms. Uh, in this case it's made of plastic. This is polyethylene. It's a long chain-like molecule. And these chain-like molecules are sort of like tangled spaghetti uh, interlinked all throughout each other. And you can push and pull the plastic because these plastic spaghetti-like molecules can slide over each other quite well. And it has these interesting properties. Look, not all amorphous solids need to be made of molecules like this. Carbon can be amorphous. You can have amorphous soot. Uh, the carbon atoms uh, forming soot molecules aggregate in the flames and they form a disordered form of carbon. Uh, and that actually uh, amorphous carbon, uh, activated carbon, is a very good filter for certain materials. It's often used, for example, in filtering out gold particles in the precipitation of gold in certain processes. Let's talk a little bit about phase changes of solids. You know most of this. Uh, when a solid changes to a liquid, that's a phase change, and that's called a melting point. Uh, it takes a certain amount of energy to do that, and that's called the molar, that's called the enthalpy of change, or the enthalpy of fusion. If we're talking about one mole of substance, it would be the molar enthalpy of fusion. Uh, if we're talking about a kilogram of substance, it would be the kilogram or the mass enthalpy change of fusion. It's giving the symbol delta F-U-S-H and it's measured typically in kilojoules per mole. It depends on the substance. Uh, it can be joules per mole if the substance is particularly weakly bound. So that's the heat required to melt a solid uh, for one mole. Um, it's a positive quantity because it's an endothermic process. When the uh, 
liquid condenses to a solid, we have heat evolved, and that's the heat of crystallization, and that's the negative of the previous quantity, negative delta of fusion, uh, heat of fusion, or enthalpy of fusion. Oops, sorry. Uh, let's look at um, a few of the melting points and heats of fusion of certain substances. Um, metals generally have low melting points, generally. Uh, for example, look at these metals here, rubidium, uh, mercury, at the ends of the periodic, they have very low, oh, I'm sorry, this is the enthalpy of change of fusion, but uh, certainly these first row metals have low melting temperatures and mercury is already liquid at normal temperature. Uh, but generally speaking, metals that have low melting points also have low enthalpy changes of fusion. Um, if they have low uh, melting points, the intermolecular forces are relatively weak. So in order to break the intermolecular forces to form the gas, that means you have not much energy to supply, and that makes sense. So here we have, in for the three periods, the fourth, fifth, and sixth period, we have... Uh, very low enthalpies of fusion here and correspondingly low melting points, you'll have to believe me here and over here. Now transition metals have high enthalpy changes of fusion and they tend to get higher uh, as the period increases. So here's the first period in green and you can see uh, relatively high uh, enthalpies of fusion, energy required to melt those substances, uh, certainly higher than these early uh, species and these late species in the mid transition metal reasons. Uh, a transition metal is one of those with d electrons, by the way, in case you didn't know. <coughs> and then uh, for the fifth period, we see quite a significant jump in the enthalpy of fusion, and then we have in the sixth period really quite a lot of enthalpy to melt these substances. Now, that's interesting. Why is that? Why does the presence of d electrons? suddenly increase the enthalpy change of fusion so much. I mean, the electrons are not supposed to be involved in chemical bonding, aren't they? They certainly fill up sort of in the middle. Interesting, isn't it? Actually, not much is known about the nature of metallic bonding in a chemical sense. That tends to be studied by physicists, uh, and they're interested in how the electrons behave and oftentimes the simple models of Lewis theory and so on do not work for understanding metallic properties. I'm not saying they don't always work but simple chemical rules don't always work for understanding these particular properties uh, and that becomes the domain of physicists and engineers. Now uh, Here's a particular table of melting points and enthalpy changes of fusion. So here we have very low melting point for mercury, negative 39, and very low enthalpy change. Here we have titanium, very high men, uh, melting point and a pretty decent enthalpy change of fusion. Tungsten, you know, double that, and certainly a very high enthalpy change of fusion. So all of this is correct, as I said before. Molecular solids have uh, very low melting points and enthalpy changes of fusion because, well, there's no intermolecular forces between these. Here are molecular solids. Um, also have relatively low uh, melting points, but the enthalpy change of fusion is larger and ionic solids, you already know, have quite high melting points uh, and enthalpy changes of fusion because of the iron-iron forces. That was a nice review. I hope you understood that. See you later.